Bio 100, Chapter 40, Circulatory System. Okay. So the beginning of your chapter talks about different circulatory systems. We are human biology, so we care most about human biology. So I will briefly touch on some of these systems and how they differ from ours, but it's not going to be the main focus of this lecture or really of this chapter for us. So just so you know, invertebrate circulatory systems, this would include things like sponges, cnidarians, and nematodes. They actually lack a separate circulatory system. They have what's known as a closed, or sorry, an open circulatory system. Um, and they basically, they do different things. But for example, a sponge will just circulate water that has oxygen in it and it goes in and out of its pores. Hydra circulate water through the gastrovascular activity, which they also use for digestion. And nematodes are thin enough that their digestive tract can actually also be used as a circulatory system. You can see larger animals actually require a separate circulatory system for nutrient and waste transport. This is when we get into the open circulatory systems um, versus the closed circulatory systems. So open means that there's no distinction between circulating and extracellular fluid. That fluid is called hemolymph. So it could be blood, it could be um, other things, and invertebrates that have this would be usually smaller, more simple um, types of invertebrates. And then usually getting into the larger animals and a lot more vertebrates is where we see a closed circulatory system, which is like what we have, where we have distinct circulatory fluid that's in blood vessels and it's transported to and from the heart in different ways. We can see here a sponge, again, a uh, open circulatory system, not a distinct system, same with the jellyfish. And then when we start getting into the vertebrates, we start to see an actual um, closed system where we have arteries and veins, blood vessels, capillaries, and they do look different. We can see a fish versus an amphibian versus a reptile versus mammals. And obviously we care most about mammals because that is the human aspect, um, but I'll touch on the others just quickly. So a fish actually has a two-chambered heart, whereas a human has a four-chambered heart or other mammals. And basically they pump their blood, their heart goes, or sorry, their blood goes out of the heart into the gills and that's where it gets oxygenated. And then it goes to the rest of the body and then it comes back into the heart to go through the process again. So it's a pretty simple system, unlike ours, which is four-chambered. And we'll go deeper into that in a second. Amphibians are actually three-chambered, so slightly more evolved, if, you, if you'll go with that. Um, now we have lungs, right? We're not just an aquatic organism. We're starting to come um, in more recent evolutionary years, really. And so because we have the lungs, now we need a second pumping circuit for double circulation. So we've got pulmonary circulation, which is moving blood between the heart and the lungs. Okay. And keep in mind, anytime you hear the word car cardial, car cardiology, you know, um, cardiac, any of those, that's heart. Pulmonary usually means something to do with lungs. Okay. So we have our pulmonary circulation between the heart and the lungs. We also have systemic. Systemic meaning um, basically the rest of the body. It's moving to like ex different extremities, um, out to the limbs, things like that. So we've got the three chambers here, one going into the heart, um, one going into the lungs, and then one going out to the body and then flowing this way back and forth. And you can see this one's kind of weird because they actually have this lighter purple here is mixed blood, a mix between oxygenated and unoxygenated. Reptile heart is kind of similar. So they also have a three chambered heart. They have two atria and two ventricles but there is not a complete separation of the ventricles here. So you can see that the mixing still occurs just like we saw um, with the amphibians as well. Okay, and then getting into more recent evolutionary history, we have mammals, birds, and crocodilians. We, they all have a four-chambered heart, two separate atria, and two separate ventricles. So the right atrium is what's receiving the deoxygenated blood. 
going through to the right ventricle, pumping it to the lungs, and then bringing back that oxygenated blood to go into the left atrium, left ventricle, through the left ventricle, and then pumping that to the rest of the body. We'll go over that in a little bit more detail as well once we get into um, how the heart is pumping blood throughout the body at the end of, or closer to the end of this lecture. But first, let's talk about what blood actually is. We know it's important. We know we need it, right? Um, and it's actually a connective tissue. So it's an extracellular matrix that has plasma and different cells within it. So we have red blood cells. We have different types of white blood cells, as well as these little things called platelets. So blood is important for transportation, regulation, protection. And you can see it's quite a few things. So we deliver oxygen and nutrients to the body. It also collects waste. It distributes hormones, spreads the heat around your body to control your temperature, plays a part in fighting infections and healing injuries. Your blood is really a key player in many critical aspects of what your body can do and how your body really maintains a homeostatic condition that allows for humans to live optimally. Blood is also a pretty significant part of our body, right? It's a twelfth of our body weight, and we've got about 11 pints, or 5 liters. So that's, that's a good amount of blood, um, although we obviously can't lose very much of it before we start seeing different organ systems or maybe different tissues that start failing because we're not able to do all those things that we just discussed, like transporting um, hormones or oxygen or, you know, regulating our body temperature, whatever it might be. So what is blood actually made up of? So 50 to 55% of it is plasma. That's the bulk of it. 1 to 2% are white blood cells and platelets. So these are the fewest cells that we see within the blood. And then the rest of it, 45 to 50%, is red blood cells. Okay, so now that we know what the composition is, we have mostly plasma followed by red blood cells and then a little bit of white blood cells in there. What are these things actually? Plasma is about 90% water. Then it's got some dissolved um, substances in there. It has glucose, again, hormones, enzymes. It also contains waste products like urea and lactic acid, which we get, um, you know, from the kidney. We, we're um, putting out waste products that our body doesn't need. Lactic acid we can get from a buildup of, like, exercise. And it also has proteins in it, so albumins, globulins, fibrinogen, um, which is what allows our blood to clot. And blood clotting is actually a good thing, right? We want to make sure that our blood can clot so that we don't just bleed out, but we don't want too much of it, right? If we have too much blood clotting, that's when we can run into other issues, but we do actually want the blood to clot. And this fibrinogen is actually what makes plasma plasma. Without it, if we didn't have the ability to clot, it would actually be referred to as serum. Okay. Then you can see our red blood cells down here, um, again, with our platelets and our white blood cells as well. Okay, so the different types of plasma globulins, we have alpha, beta, which helps transport lipids, like our cholesterol. And then we have gamma, which is the disease-fighting substances, also known as antibodies. So these are the three type of three types of plasma globulins that we see within the plasma. Okay, going into white blood cells, these are commonly referred to as our leukocytes, and they can divided be divided into two major subcategories of granulocytes and agranulocytes. All together, this makes up less than one percent of our blood cells. They are larger than erythrocytes, which are our red blood cells, and these guys have nuclei which is a little bit different. And the granulite, granulocytes, these guys, these actually also have granules in them. So that's how you can differentiate what type of white blood cell to begin with, is you can distinguish whether it has granules in it and it's a granulocyte or a granulocyte that does not. Granular leukocytes, this would be things like our neutrophils, our eosinophils, our basophils. Um, these are involved in helping the body fight like bacterial infections. Um, they also, these little granules, which are basically these little small particles here, 
Um, they've got different enzymes that can be re released during bacterial infections, potentially allergic reactions as well, or asthmatic reactions. And then we have the agranulocytes over here that do not have those little small granules within them. Those are our monocytes and our lymphocytes. These guys are more involved in foreign invaders. So they're protecting against things foreign to the body, which these guys are too, but these are kind of like the, I don't know, I would call them the big heavy hitters. So they're, you know, more like viral infections, um, cancerous cells. Uh, they're, they're kind of going after the bigger things for the most part. And the lymphocytes also have the B and T cells, which we won't get into too far in this, but those are what are responsible for your immune system response, essentially. Okay, so again, our medical terminology for these are leukocytes. They are our defense against disease. They circulate in blood vessels, and then they slip outside of the blood vessels to sites of injury or damaged cells. So you can see that they're going to attack anything that is foreign. Um, and make sure that our immune system is kicking in and keeping our blood and the rest of our body healthy. Okay, so the way that they do this is they follow a chemical trail of molecules. We won't get into a lot of the specifics because we could spend a whole class talking about the immune system and white blood cells and their role within all of that. But just know in general that these guys are kind of responsible for being defense against disease or infection. Into the red blood cells, these are our erythrocytes. There are about 5 million per microliter of blood, so we have quite a lot. Remember, it makes up anywhere from 40 to 50% of your blood, so it is a good um, portion of it. And the main reason is that it has hemoglobin in it. Hemoglobin is a molecule that binds four molecules of oxygen to each one, and that will bind and transport oxygen throughout the body. So that's why we have so many red blood cells. They can live for about 120 days, so we're we're making red, new red blood cells and losing red blood cells pretty much constantly throughout our life. Um, and you can see here, hematocrit is the fraction of the total blood volume occupied by red blood cells. You'll see that often as a um, measurement that can be taken to see how many red blood cells you really have. Usually, you'll just see things written as like a red blood cell count versus uh, hematocrit counts. But... Uh, more mature mammalian erythrocytes lack nuclei. So that's a little bit different than our white blood cells that have nuclei, and some of them have those granules as well. But the reason why we have so many more red blood cells is, again, the oxygen component, right? They're really small, well, they're pretty small cells, but they have a large surface area. So it allows for more oxygen and even CO2 diffusion across them. And that's something that's really helpful for our bodies and, and helps maintain optimal functionality within them. Okay, so these guys do have a concave shape. Again, they're carrying oxygen with them, um, and they have these hemoglobins on them. There's both alpha and beta and heme molecules, which has a iron atom. And they're iron rich, which means that when you look at them, you'll see that they're kind of reddish looking, part of how they get their, their name. Um, and then the oxygen from our lungs actually attaches to this heme molecule, and that is what adds the oxygen to the red blood cells. Hemoglobin, also referred to as oxyhemoglobin, um, blood that travels to the tissues, and then sorry hemoglobin has oxygen on it and if we refer to it as oxyhemoglobin that's the stuff that's traveling to the tissues oxy meaning it's oxygenated um hemoglobin can lose its oxygen as well and then it would go into deoxyhemoglobin which is blood that's traveling to the lungs to then get oxygenated and then become oxyhemoglobin to go back out to the tissues and provide all of them with the oxygen that they need to function so you can see here, oxygenated blood is bright red. Oxygenated blood is deep red or purple. If you get cuts um, in different parts of your body sometimes, or if you cut different parts of your body, um, you might see a brighter red, which is um, 
you know, ideally we don't really want to see blood in either case, but <laughs> uh, bright red or deep red purple would tell you whether it's oxygenated or deoxygenated. Okay, within the blood, we also have these things called platelets, and they're actually just little cell fragments that pinch off from larger cells within the bone marrow. And they are, you'll see here a fibrin clot, they are functioning in the formation of blood clots as well. Okay, so let's talk about characteristics of blood vessels. Um, we've got different types of blood vessels depending on where our blood is going in the body, but blood leaves the heart through the arteries. So usually when you see um, like a diagram of a heart, you'll see red or even of a body, really, um, you'll see red and blue, right? Blue meaning deoxygenated in most cases, red meaning oxygenated. It's not actually what these things look like in our body. If you see blue under your skin, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a vein. Um, that has more to do, something we won't get into. But anyways, um, the blood leaves the heart through the arteries. Um, these are thicker walled vessels carrying blood, oxygenated blood, to the tissues of the body. So they're thicker walled because the ar arteries have a higher blood pressure within them um, because they are going further places, coming from the heart. Arterioles are the finest microscopic branches of the arterial tree. So these are going into the capillaries. So we're kind of lessening the pressure here, going into smaller um, blood vessels, essentially. And capillaries are in places where we need really good diffusion. So like in our lungs, where we need really good diffusion of CO2 and oxygen. And then we also collect our blood into these venules, which lead into larger vessels, which are known as our veins. Usually, again, diagrammed as blue because they're deoxygenated. And then they're going to carry the blood back to the heart to have it pump through and then go out to the lungs to get oxygenated once again. So arteries and veins are both composed of four different tissue layers. They have the endothelium, the elastic fibers, smooth muscle, and connective tissue. Um, these, because there's four different layers for both our arteries and our veins, it's too thick for any exchange of materials across the wall. So that's why we have to go into those thinner walled capillaries. They only have a single layer of endothelial cells, and so what it can do is it can rapidly exchange gases and metabolites between blood and body cells. So gases, again, would be like oxygen and carbon dioxide. Okay, how do blood cells actually form? All blood cells originate in the blood marrow, and they originate from one type of cell known as a stem cell. I don't know if you guys have heard of stem cells or like stem cell research. Sometimes it gets kind of a negative connotation. It's not anything negative. Literally, a stem cell is a cell that doesn't know what it's going to be yet. Um, and they're very valuable because a stem cell can essentially be anything, right? So it will then go through a differentiation process and it will become specialized. And it might become an erythroblast or a myeloblast or a monoblast, a lymphoblast. It can become different types of cells. So stem cells are just essentially the newest cells that we make from our red bone marrow, okay? And then it'll go through that cell differentiation process where it becomes specialized and it can go to different tissues. It might become a red blood cell. It might become a um, lymphocyte, whatever it's going to end up being. Okay, so our erythroblasts you can see here are what make our erythrocytes, our red blood cells. Again, we lose our nucleus here. And for a myeloblast, we can go into either the granular leukocytes or our monoblast can go into a monocyte and a lymphoblast into a lymphocyte. So these make up all of our white blood cells and this megakaryoblast, megakaryocyte, and that differentiates even further into these small platelets that help with the blood clotting within um, our blood. Okay, so again, if there's, with blood clotting, if you have an injury, say you have a cut on your arm or something, the damage to a blood vessel will expose the vessel muscle layers and tissues to the blood. So you're going to get the blood vessel contracting and reducing blood flow so that we're not losing all of it. 
and then these platelets form like a little plug basically that they, ad they adhere to each other and the damaged vessel and then you get this sol soluble fibrinogen um of all these fibrin stands and they kind of come together and trap all of the red blood cells and platelets so that we don't again bleed out okay different blood groups do I was going to say, does anyone, do any of you know what your blood group is? Maybe you've been blood typed before, maybe you haven't, but we all fall into four basic blood groups. We can be A, B, AB, or O. The way that we determine what blood group we are is determined by a marker on red blood cells known as antigens. Plasma also contains antibodies to other blood groups. This is the reason why we cannot mix different blood types in most cases. Okay. So we'll see here um, if we have uh, the, let's see here, the antibodies um, over here versus, so like let's say that this is an A blood type and this is a B blood type. So we have an A blood cell that has an A marker on it, but it has the antibody for B, which means that it will not bind to that, okay? And then same thing over here, if we have B, we have an A antibody that will not bind to that. Oh, there it is. There's my markers. So we have type A blood here and type B blood here. And then we have an antibody to type B, which means that A will not bind with it. We can see here, essentially, this is kind of the same table that you're going to be filling out in your assignment for this week. So we have type A blood, type B, type AB, and type O. So the antigens that we have match the blood type that we have, okay? Um, so for type A, we have antigen A, B, B. AB means that it's actually co-dominant, which means that we have both A and B. Type O, we don't have A or B. Okay. Antibodies. So these are kind of like what it says. It sounds it's kind of hard to differentiate sometimes if you don't know the difference between antigen and antibody. But antibody means essentially what you're not going to bind to. So we have antibodies for B and type A blood. For B, we have type A. Type AB, we don't have either one. And for type O, we have both of them. Okay. And you can see here the number of um or the percentage of different classifications like Caucasians. Most of us have type O. Well, most of us, I say us because I'm white. Um, but most white people have uh, type O, 45%, and then followed by type A. Very few have type AB. African Americans, again, most have type O, followed by type A. So pretty similar, actually, although there's just a change in numbers. But the prevalence for each one of these is pretty similar. Um, type O is most popular in most demographics, including Native Americans, and you'll see type A is second, and then they have 0% of the type AB. H factor, this is an inherited protein that is found on the surface of the blood. So if you've ever heard like, oh, I'm O positive or I'm AB negative, this is what determines the positive or negative. So this protein that's found on the surface of your blood, if you have it, you're considered Rh positive. If you do not have it, you're considered Rh negative. Most people have it. Doesn't matter what race or nationality you are. Um, most people tend to be Rh positive. So this doesn't matter too much, um, mostly in terms of giving or receiving blood, but the time when it can be a problem is actually during pregnancy. Um, if you are a woman or if you're someone that can, is pregnant and you are RH negative and your fetus is RH positive, meaning that they got the RH positive from your partner, that's referred to as RH incompatibility. So what can happen with that is, let's say we have a man and a woman um, that mate and are having this baby. So the man is RH positive, the woman's RH negative, and the baby then has RH positive. What will happen is essentially the woman um, will develop antibodies against RH antigen, and then that will cross into the placenta and actually attack the fetus's red blood. 
So it's not something that we want to have happen. It can be dangerous and or even fatal to the fetus. So if it's known that you're mixing these blood types or if you find out pretty early on what the blood types are of you and your baby, which normally they do test for pretty early on, they can actually um, give you something so that you do not develop these antibodies and then attack your own fetus, right? Um, so that is something to keep in mind if you are pregnant or if you have someone that is pregnant in your life, that's something to look out for. Okay, so with these blood types, you might have um, wondered how they mix, if you've ever had to get a blood transfusion or if you've heard of blood transfusions, if you lose a lot of blood or if something's happening in your body where you need um, more blood, then you have to be careful of who you get the blood from. Obviously, we don't want different um, diseases or, or, you know, we want someone who's healthy that's donating blood, but we also want to make sure that the blood matches our blood type. So if you have group O, congratulations, you are a universal donor, which means that anyone can take your blood. A, a B, B, all of them can take group O blood. Um, if you have group AB, you are also that's like the best group to be really because it means you can take any blood from anyone you can take a blood you can take b blood you can take a b blood you can take o blood you can take it all whereas group o can't take it all but it can give it all so you know there's pros and cons to each one ideally i think you want to be a b um but it just depends on what blood type you have who you can take blood type blood from and who you can give blood to Okay, touching very briefly on the lymphatic system, I'll let you read more about this in your text if you would like, um, but there's significant amount of water and solutes within the blood that the plasma actually filters through the walls of these capillaries, those little thin walled um, blood vessels, to form what's known as interstitial or tissue fluid. That fluid does not return to capillaries um, and it in instead returns to to circulation by the lymphatic system. You've probably heard of like lymph nodes and if you have extra lymph or something in different um, parts of your body. And the way that that returns to circulation is through the subclavian vein. At this point in time, just know that this exists and it's part of the circulatory system um, or, you know, it's often discussed with the circulatory system, but we don't really need to know too many more details yet. Okay, getting into the heart, and I posted a video from Amoeba Sisters because I really like their animations. I think they're easy to follow. They do a really good job of telling you how blood is flowing through the heart, and they even have a section for you to stop and quiz yourself, so I highly recommend that. Um, and again, you can see here the blue is pretty much representing deoxygenated blood, while the red is representing oxygenated blood. But we have all of our deoxygenated blood coming in to the heart through either the inferior or the superior vena cava. Right? It's then going into the right atrium and then going through this thing called a tricuspid um, valve. That is also known as the AV valve. AV valve meaning atrioventricular, so the valves between the atrium and the ventricle. So we have two of them. One is known as the tricuspid valve, and then one is known as the mitral valve over here on the left side. Um, but on the right side, this is where we have our deoxygenated blood. So we're going through the right atrium, through this tricuspid valve, into the right ventricle. And then from the right ventricle, we're going through the pulmonary valve up here and going out the left pulmonary artery. Okay. Pulmonary arteries. So again, arteries usually carry deox or oxygenated blood. Sorry. Um, in this case, it's deoxygenated, but we're going from the heart. So it's still an artery, but it's going to go straight to the lungs. So this pulmonary artery is going to go down here, go to the lungs. It's going to go all through the lungs, all that blood. It's going to get oxygenated, and then it's going to come back up through the pulmonary vein. Okay, so you'll see the pulmonary veins over here. Once it goes through the pulmonary vein, it's going to go into the left atrium, again, through an AV valve called the mitral valve, and then into the left ventricle, and then it'll go out the aortic, um, uh, the aortic valve, 
okay? So the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve, both of these are also referred to as semilunar valves. So AV valve over here between the atrium and the ventricle, semilunar valve between the ventricle and wherever it's going to, whether an artery or a vein, essentially. Um, or sorry, I should say it's always it's always going to an artery. Arteries go from the heart, veins go to the heart. And again, usually veins are deoxygenated, but we switch here when they come back to the heart from the lungs because they're oxygenated. And this artery, again, is deoxygenated because it's going to the lungs. But with the without those exceptions, the rest of them, veins are deoxygenated, uh, arteries are oxygenated. And once we go through this pulmonary valve right here, our last semilunar valve, we're going into the aorta. And then that's going to connect up to different arteries and blood vessels and capillary systems going out to the rest of the body to deliver oxygen to the rest of the body and into those different organ systems and tissues. Okay. So again, those two pairs of valves, we have our atrioventricular valves. Both of these are maintaining a unidirectional blood flow um, between the different areas of the valve. So for the AV valves, it's between the atria and the ventricles. Again, the tricuspid valve is on the right. The bicuspid or the mitral valve, which is what it's more often referred to as, is on the left-hand side. These are essentially what makes sure the blood doesn't flow backwards through the system. That would be really, really bad. If these valves malfunction and you have blood flowing back through, you're basically not going to get blood pumping through the right way and getting out to your body to get oxygen to your tissues. So we need these valves. And this is actually... What makes when, if you've ever listened to a heartbeat, if you've, um, even if you felt your pulse, that little d d that you um, feel, or if you listen with a stethoscope and the do 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 do, or more appropriately, I could say lub dub lub dub lub dub. This is the lub sound, the closing of this AV valve, right, or closing of both AV valves, and then the semilunar is actually the dub sound. Okay, so this again ensures only a one-way flow out of the ventricles to the vessels. Um, and again, we either have the pulmonary valve, which is at the exit of the right ventricle, and then we're going to go, remember, pulmonary to the lungs. Aortic valve is located at the exit of the left ventricle, and that's when we're going to go out to um, different arteries out to the body. Oxygenated the blood. So all of this is happening because of electrical pulses. Right. Um, we have different things. We won't get too deep into it, but we have an electrical pulse that travels from our sinoatrial node or commonly referred to as the SA node. And that's right here. And that sends out a pulse that says, OK, we're going to contract and contract and relax our atriums and our ventricles and pump blood through the heart. So it sends that electrical um, signal to from the SA node to the walls of the atria. And that causes the atrium to contract, or the atria is um, singular, atrium, plural. Then once it reaches the AV um, node, it delays it by about 0.1 seconds. And then there's this thing called a Purkinje fiber that you can see down here. So at this point, we have the Purkinje fiber is um, it's basically branching together those signals, carrying them from the AV node to the heart apex, which is down here. And then once that signal spreads through the ventricle walls, walls, it'll cause them to contract as well. So essentially, we're sending an electrical signal from here, contracting the atria, sending it over here, down the heart, to the apex, and then contracting the ventricles subsequently. So the valves open and close as the heart goes through these um, through the cardiac cycle. Ventricles are relaxed and filling. This is known as diastole. This is the majority of the time, right? So diastole is about two-thirds of the cardiac cycle, whereas contracting and pumping, the systole, that's about a third of it. And again, the lub dub, lub dub, the AV valves closing is your lub, and the dub is the closing of the semilunar valves. So you'll know if you've ever heard this or if you've ever listened through a stethoscope, this is pretty fast. All of this is really happening within milliseconds of each other. Um, it's essentially happening at the same time that your heart is pumping through and going through this whole process. Um, but it is 
technically happening at different times, but it's just so close together, it's really hard to tell, um, other than potentially hearing this love dub sound. So, these Purkinje fibers are self-excitable autorhythmic fibers. Um, the most important one are all of the all of the electric signals within the heart have these electric fibers. So there's different fibers: the Purkinje fiber, the AV node, um, as well as the SA node. The SA node is the biggest one. That's basically our pacemaker, right? So when you hear about people having a pacemaker put in, it's potentially because this SA node is not working as well, and it's in the wall of the right atrium. And basically our autonomic nervous system, autonomic meaning voluntary nervous system, helps modulate this rate, right? We're not doing this consciously. This is something that's happening voluntarily. Um, but we are basically moderating this SA node, which is pacemaking how much and how fast our heart beats. We can record this electrical activity. You can see every part of that. So when we go through depolarizing and contracting the atrium, if you're looking at an EKG or an ECG, an electrocardiogram, you'll see this little P wave. And then we have a quick QRS. That's when we depolarize and contract our ventricle. And then we go into a repolarization or relaxation of the atrium. So you'll see from start of the contracting of the ventricle to the end of the contracting of the ventricle and the next beat. That's one second. So this is all happening really quickly. And again, you'll see the diastole, the relaxing is about two thirds and the contracting, um, the systole is about one third. There are lots of cardiovascular diseases. We won't go too deep into them, but they are the leading cause of death in the United States. Um, there's a lot of different things that can go into it. Um, in general, heart disease is, I think, the, really the leading cause of death. Um, atherosclerosis is accumulating fatty material within the arteries that then impedes blood flow. So getting all of this extra plaque within the arteries, right? That's when you hear about different bypasses and things that you have to do. Um, and then you also have arteriosclerosis, which is arterial hardening due to calcium deposition. Both are things that we do not want to happen. We want to have a normal artery here that has normal blood flow. And um, again, a pretty thick artery blood well, but you can see that it's not clogged with plaque. If we start to have our blood um, not flowing as easily, that's when we start to get higher blood pressure. Yep. So blood pressure, I'm sure all of you have had your blood pressure measured before and you're given two numbers, right? So let's say 120 over 80. That's kind of the ideal blood pressure. You wanna be somewhere around that. And the 120, right? That's your systole, um, yeah, systolic number. That's your systole. That's your ventricle contraction number. The bottom number, the diastole or your diastolic, that's the relaxation, okay? So when we're measuring blood pressure, it's measuring the pressure that's put on your arteries as blood flows through them. This can increase with blood volume, and blood volume we regulate by four different hormones. Something called an antidiuretic hormone, ADH. Aldosterone, we also, um, also regulates our blood volume, and this is what encourages our kidney to excrete potassium and retain or keep sodium. Also, uh, atrial natriuretic hormone that increases sodium excretion and decreases blood pressure and nitric oxide or NO that's a vasodilator which means that it's making um, your arteries or blood vessels dilate meaning making them bigger right so this is just a little bit about blood pressure blood pressure is um, if you ever get a chance to do it on someone it is kind of cool and you'll see if someone like a doctor or a nurse is taking your blood pressure they'll put the cuff around you on your upper arm and then usually they'll have a stethoscope as well unless they have a machine that's doing it but what they're doing is they're pumping up that cuff <clears throat> to a point where you no longer have blood flow through the artery that they're measuring when you have no blood flow they're not going to hear anything in the stethoscope because there's not going to be any blood flowing also if you have blood flowing at a constant rate they're not going to hear anything so they'll pump up that cuff until they don't hear anything, and then they'll slowly start releasing pressure 
And then when they first hear something, they'll hear like a t t t t And that's your blood flowing through the artery through um, <clears throat> or having kind of a turbulent flow because it's not fully opened, but it can still get through. That's your first number, your top number, that 120. That's your first blood pressure, your systolic number. And then they're going to keep listening. And then once they no longer hear any ch 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 or ch ch ch, that means that your blood is now flowing completely as it normally would. And so that has ended um, the, the blood pressure reading. And that is the diastolic number or your bottom number. So if they start hearing your blood at 120, that's your um, systole. And then diastole, your relaxation, would be at, let's say, 80. So that's how they actually measure blood pressure. It's a pretty cool process if you ever do get to do it. But the next time you get your blood pressure measured, you can be thinking about what it's actually doing and what they are listening for when they do it.